Amen. Well, you can be seated. Children, you guys can go back now. If you're going to, good luck. Have fun. Forgot two announcements. Uh, Emily Longmore, she just graduated uh, graduate school. And did you have to take boards? Um, What'd you have to do? A special. She had to pass a credentialed national exam. She, she's licensed dietitian now. She just got her first job. So that's cool, you know. So congratulations. Or, or good work. Because it wasn't luck. It was hard work and discipline. So that's good. And also Paul and uh, Ken. So they have a... Uh, mostly Ken. They've taken over our church schedule and said that we are having a barbecue on March 13th. March 13th. So... Church will get the meat, they will smoke the meat, and you guys bring a side. March 13th. It's not in the bulletin. Sorry, Bob. It, uh, I'm just, you know, the middleman here. But it's going to be fun. No, it's going to be fun. So invite a friend, you know, bring someone. Uh, it's always fun. So it's going to be good. It's a spring. There's nothing going on. It's just uh, got a lot to be thankful for. So we're going to do that. Okay. Now, uh, if you have your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 12. You know we're in Romans still. We're comfy right there. Now, before we get reading, you know, let's go back to Christ's final hour. His last day, his death. He is with his disciples. And they decide to have a meal in this upstairs room. And they're there. Soon he's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he will pray there. He will be betrayed there and arrested there. He will have an illegal nighttime trial with the Jewish leaders up all night, being beaten and mocked, declared guilty, sent to a Roman trial the next morning. He will spend all day there, also being mocked and beaten, condemned, and then he will carry his cross to Calvary and he will die that afternoon. And he knows all this is about to happen. So he does a few things in this last hour with his men. First, he washes their feet, showing them what kind of, how they're supposed to humbly serve one another. He gives them a lesson, and then he prays with them. So in this lesson, he says something very interesting. It's in John 13, 34 and 35. He tells them all, he says, listen, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also Love one another. By this will all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now imagine these 11 guys sitting there. You got a couple fishermen, you know, Peter and Andrew, James and John. So, uh, you know, they probably got some calloused hands, some backs, because they're pulling in these nets all the time. You know, it's a labor job. In these boats, working the oars, you know, they're probably a little sunburnt with squinty eyes, because they didn't have sunglasses back then, you know out all day. So you got these four guys sitting there, you know, looking around at each other. They brought big beards, probably. Peter's the oldest because he was already married. His name's always mentioned first. He's the natural leader. So you got old Peter there with his little brother, Andrew, and then these two other guys from his hometown, James and John. And they're crazy guys because Jesus says, you guys are sons of thunder. And whenever anyone like Jesus, they're like, Jesus, should we uh, call down fire like Elijah and burn them all up? Jesus is like, no, you sons of thunder. So there's those guys. Then you got Matthew over here. And Matthew, you know, he's a tax collector. Works behind a desk. Probably spends most of his time inside. So, you know, maybe a little pale. You know, softer hands. Maybe a little ink stained from from counting all this money over the years. You know, and he's wealthy. You know, when he comes to Jesus, he wasn't on a boat. You know, he was called out of his job and he threw a party at his house for Jesus. So this guy, he's a little different. Then you got Nathaniel who, Nathaniel, as soon as Jesus met him, said, this is a good guy. This is a real Israelite right here. So you got this godly religious guy. And that's not what what Peter said, right? When Peter met Jesus, he says, get away from me, Lord. You don't like me. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Then you got Simon the Zealot. So... His name is The Zealot. The Zealot was this uh, political extremist party in Israel made up of Jewish men who hated the Romans so much they were known for carrying a dagger around and they sought to incite revolutions to get Rome out of their land. And in AD 70, they incited a big revolution and it, inclu- you know, it ended up causing everything 
Boy, these zealots. So you have this guy who's basically a terrorist, and now Jesus says, hey, you follow me. So we got an eclectic bunch sitting around from all these branches of life. One guy, you know, he's got his weapon at his side ready to kill a soldier. You know, this guy water, this guy worked behind a desk, this guy who probably thinks they're all terrible. And Jesus says, you guys got to love each other. He's like, that's my commandment. It's a new one. You ready? Love each other. We're looking around. He's like, you know, no one's going to know that you're mine unless you do that. You got to love each other. You know, earlier Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment in the whole Oh, and this is what he says in Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So sum up all of God's message is, hey, love me, love each other. In the epistle of 1 John, John was there that night. He writes this to the churches, 1 John 3, 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. That simplified Christianity. Believe in the name of Jesus and love each other. That's all you got to do. Anyone who tries to complicate it further than that is trying to sell you something. Believe and love. In the church in Galatia, some people trying to sell something showed up. And they said, hey, guys, by the way, you're not a real Christian unless you all get circumcised and become Jewish men and follow the law. Paul heard that. He said, that's not the gospel. Galatians 5, 6, he says, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Faith working through love. You know, after the Protestant Reformation happened, this was the great rallying cry in Germany. These men used to say nothing but faith working through love. That's what we are. That's what the Christian faith, the Christian life, the church is all about. Faith working through love. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians. He says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am become a noisy gong. Or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. He says, I can do all these religious things. I can preach and perform miracles and give generously and even die for the name of Jesus Christ. But if I'm not loving, he's like, I'm like a kid playing on a new drum set, making a lot of noise, but he ain't making music. So New Hope Bible Church, we who have believed on the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and trusted Him as our Savior and Him alone for our salvation by grace. Christ alone, let us love one another. So what does love look like? Is it a feeling? Is it sentimental, an emotion? Or is it something else? In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul describes love. You've probably heard it at almost every wedding you've ever been to. It's a beautiful passage. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag, is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. How many of you guys ever had that? Was that read at your wedding? Yeah? Madeline, it was read right. Yeah. So cliche. <laughs> I think it was read right at mine too. All right, that's a beautiful passage. That's great. But in Romans chapter 12, Paul kind of gives a similar list. He gives 13 declarations of what the Christian life looks like in the center around love. It's not as popular, but it's where we're at this morning. And I think I like it more. If you can do that, I don't know. Romans chapter 12, let's read it. Verses 9 through 13. This is our passage today. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what's evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Preserving in tribulation. Devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Love in action is what we're talking about today. Love's not a feeling. Love isn't words we use. 
It moves. In the 90s, it was big, right? Love is a verb. Yeah, I think a DC Talk song saying about that. But it's true. 1 John 3.18, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. Love in action. So now, all of these 13 things could be a sermon in itself. But uh, I'm not going to do that today. Okay? I'm going to go do six of them. I could do 13 sermons. But uh, we're going to do six today. So, six things about love. Number one, love is genuine. You see that first line in verse 9? Let love be without hypocrisy. Do you know what a hypocrite is? In the Greek, in, in Greece, you know, originally it was an actor that wore a mask. A hypocrite. They would hide their true selves to be seen as something else. Have any of you guys ever worked in food service? We're, we're, we know about putting on. You got to put that smile on when it walks through. Rebecca, when you're doing that, yeah. That's that same old person. Your nerves, when they walk in, you got to put the mask on. When I worked at Papa John's, I thought about not telling you this story, but you know, I'm a fallen creature and it's funny. So, one time I worked at Papa John's one night, you know, I was, uh, I was just stressed. It was dinner rush and this lady called and man, you know, it's just one of those people that takes, takes 10 minutes to say what could be said in like 10 seconds. And she was going on and on. So, I rushed her and I was a little rude and she hung up on me. And I don't even remember thinking, I was just, oh, that's whatever. Answer the next phone, kept going about my day. Well, then I'm working the next shift the next morning. I was manager. And this lady calls back. She says, sir, I don't know who. No. She said, sir, I called last night. And the employee was so rude. I hung up on him. And I want to know who he was. And I want him to be. And I said, do you know his name? Because I knew. No, I don't. I said, well, my name is David Kleinhans. And I will find out who that was. So. Don't forget my name. I'll find out who he is. You know what that is? That's being a hypocrite. Okay? Don't encourage that. Okay. Um, and it ended there. <laughs> Never heard from her again. Now, we all put on masks, though, don't we? Monday morning, you put on your work mask when you don't want to be there. Okay? You know, you're walking through Publix, and you see someone, you hope they don't see you, but then they see you, so you put your mask on real fast. Hey! Yeah. And, you know, we put a church mask on, right? Maybe a spouse, you know, a couple, they fight all week, can't stand each other, fight the whole way to church. But when they pull into that church parking lot, let's put our game face on, we're going to church now. You know, I remember growing up, kids were in that old Astro van, there was four of us, we usually had other kids with us, and we were fighting and screaming the whole way to church, you know, and then finally we pull in, my mom's like, everybody shut up! <laughs> we're at church. So we put on the mask. Okay, we all love each other here. You know, um, he says, let love be without hypocrisy. You know, in, in the English Standard Version, it says, let your love be genuine. So, you know, when we see people at church, and we're nice, you know, is that a mask? And when they turn around and they go away, are we willing to kind of drop that mask a little bit? And then we say what we really think about the people. Um, that's hypocritical love, you know. If we're united in Christ and brothers and sisters Lord, we love because of Jesus, not because we're likable. You know, at a country club, or at a fishing club, or at a golf club, or at a, you know, whatever other club you join on Facebook, you get around people that are like you and enjoy your hobbies, and you all are in the same spot in life, and then everyone gets along, but the church... It's supposed to be different from the world. So what God does is He takes people that have no same interests, that are in all different areas of life, that don't like the same anything, and put them all together and say, now if you can get along, that's special. Anyone can find some common interests on the internet and make a group of friends. That's not special. That's not supernatural. That's what everybody does. But if you guys can get along in church, that's the real deal. So we need to learn to love each other genuinely. Not hypocritically. Now we're talking about actions. We're really good at showing love to each other while we're here. So what we're really talking about is when we leave here, don't drop that mask. Don't start talking bad about each other then. Don't fake your but love each other genuinely. You know, everyone says the church is full of hypocrites. I always wonder about that. Sometimes we make choices that fall short of what we claim to believe in. Does that make us hypocrites? 
Well, if we come to church to justify ourselves and parade our own self-righteousness and judge everyone who's not here, I would say, yeah, then that makes us hypocrites. And maybe that's what the world thinks church is all about. But in reality, you know, we come to church as sinners in need of our Savior. We come as debtors to the grace of God. We come knowing, knowing our weaknesses. So we come here. Come. Don't forget that we all have faults. Don't forget that we're all weak. Don't forget that we all come as sinners clinging to our Savior. And we all come as debtors to God's grace. And if we keep that in mind, maybe we can learn to show each other love in a genuine way without hypocrisy. So when you come to church, don't come as an actor coming to the stage. Come as a son or daughter coming home to the Father's house. Because when you're down at your parents' house, when you're home with your family, that's when you're yourself, right? That's when you can say, hey, they've known me through thick and thin. They've known everything I've done. I can be my worst or I can be my best and I can speak my mind, but I'm at least me. That's what church is. We're not playing at We're family. So let your, let your love be genuine. Number two, love is balanced. Okay, let's read this next line. Abhor what's evil, cling to what is good. There's this idea in the world today that love just means complete acceptance and affirmation of who a person is, what they believe, and how they choose to live. That's not biblical love. Biblical love and complete blind acceptance are two very different things. Paul says that we should abhor what's evil and cling to what is good. And when he wrote to the church in Corinth, there was this guy who slept with his stepmom. And the church, he says, was being arrogant and boasting about their acceptance of this man. And Paul says, you fools. That's not love. He says, your boasting's not good. He says, actually, you need to talk with him. You need to have some church with him for the sake of his soul. So, <clears throat> we sing, come as you are. And we believe that. Come as you are, of course. But we don't preach, leave the same. You know, Jesus Christ came to us in our moment of need. And he accepted everybody. Everybody could come to him. And he would preach, and he would heal, and he would, he would teach, and he would show love. This is all true. But don't ever think that Jesus just accepted their sin. When he met the woman, well, he, he loved her, but he also called her. He says, you've been married four times, and now you're living with a guy you're not married to. He called her out. When he saw the woman who was caught in adultery, he says, hey, okay, he that's without sin, you cast the first stone. But then when everyone left, he said, listen, go and, and sin no more. Don't keep that up. When he had the 11 apostles, he was teaching, and he loved them. But when they lacked faith, he says, oh, you of little faith. Why are you doubting? He called them out. When Peter, I mean, he loved Peter. They were close, very close. But when Peter says, Lord Jesus, you're wrong there, he says, get behind me, Satan. He called him out strongly. He says, you're not savoring the things of God. You are liking the things of man. Jesus loved people, but he called people out too. When we do this, we do it out of love. You know, if my son wants to ride his bike in front of traffic, I don't say, well, he just loves it so much and I love him so much. Go out there and have some fun. Is that love? No. It's permissive, but it ain't love. Say, like, oh, he asked me last night, can I just... He's like, I ate a lot of Sour Patch Kids and I want a little bit more and I don't want to eat my dinner. I was like, just, just shut up and eat. Just eat your dinner. No, he ain't having more Sour Patch Kids. I love him a lot, and I want him to be happy. But it doesn't mean I give him candy for dinner. But at night, he's like, Dad, I'm just not in the mood. Um, this is what he said to me two nights ago. He said, Dad, bedtime's just it's not really fun for me. That's what he said. He says, I just don't enjoy it. And I was like, well, why not? I thought maybe he was having bad dreams, you know, maybe something's going on. I said, why not, buddy? He goes, well, I just would really rather play. And I was like, go to bed. <laughs> Don't get out of bed again until the sun comes up, you know, because I love him because I love him. We love each other. 
So sometimes we're convinced that, you know, I don't want to have that hard conversation and, you know, God is love and I don't want to, I, I, just, I just don't want to tell them that they're wrong and I don't want to correct that unbiblical thinking and I don't, I don't want to tell them that what they're doing there is just is sin. I don't want to do that. I love them, you know, it's all about love. It's like, well, real love tries to help people. I mean, God loved us enough to send Christ to die for us, not to pat us on the back and say, you're doing great. We weren't. Sometimes, you know, a little spiritual surgery requires a scalpel. And Christian brothers and sisters got to be able to wield that scalpel patiently, lovingly, but they got to do it. Now, the truth is, though, in our more conservative circles, which we're in, some of us are a little too ready with the scalpel. And we come into church being, I'm ready to love you all. All right, I'm the this person in here. Let me cut you up. Look at that. Look at that. You got your love. What's going on over there? That's terrible. That's terrible these people you know but then we say oh we're the lovingest person so it's balanced we abhor what is evil what paul also says you cling to what is good you cling to what is good it's like a coach right a coach will call out a player when they make a mistake and he will say you got to do better but when they get a hit when they make the tackle when they start to improve the coach also says you're doing good that's what we're talking about so we cling to what is good in the greek it's like glue you stick to it you stick to what is good not what is bad you hate the bad, but you stick to the good. So we celebrate wins. We give credit to When we see a little hey, I see that. And that's awesome. We cling to the good. It's balanced. It's balanced. And it's a hard balance. It's true. But that's biblical love. So love is balanced. Love is genuine. Number three, love is devoted. Look what it says next. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. So we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And as such, we should love each other like brothers and sisters. You know, we should be there for each other through thick and thin. We should be faithful and true to one another. When no one else shows up, we should. You know, when no one else calls, we should. When no one else cares, we should. When everyone else gives up, we don't. When everyone else walks out, we stay. We love each other devotedly devotedly we look for ways to show love paul told timothy this young guy he said listen in the church you're like a family he's like so all the younger girls i want you to look at them like your little sister with all purity and those boys i want you to look at them like your little brothers that's how you treat each other you know i got two little sisters i remember when my sister courtney had her first date her first date ever i called up my buddy reed and Aaron, about two feet taller than me broad shouldered i said guys we got a problem Courtney's got her first date. He's picking her up at six. I need you at my house. They're like, we'll be there. They, they, she was like a sister to them too. So uh, there's these three guys. There's little me, both of them. My dad was there too. He wasn't any happier. And I'm like, all right, when this guy shows up, we're going to make sure that he knows that he can't make her cry. He can't treat her poorly. He cannot take advantage of her or he will answer to all of us. Guys, these Vikings that were next to me, you know. And then he showed up wearing a pink polo. And he was a little late because he just came from ballerina practice. I am not lying. So I said, you know what? He's all right. <laughs> I don't know what you call a male ballerina, but that guy was one of them. I was like, we're not needed here. You guys can go home. But that is the attitude that biblical love should assume, that we're devoted to each other. And when I look at you guys, I'm like, these are like family. So I'm not going to listen when people try to talk bad. I can call them out lovingly you say anything about them behind their back that's my brother that's my sister you know if they call it's like yeah i'm tired yeah i got this going on but yeah i'll, I'll come still i'll be there but not me because on the path all should look at each other like that and this is one of the awesome things about being in a smaller church you know you get these big churches with all these people and it's like yeah that's great they can get a lot done but man we're a family here we can be a real church here you know when people walk through that door some of them don't have their own families anymore. Some of them have fallen out, you know, with brother and sister, with parents. But when they come here, this should be a family. We're united by Christ, not by blood. We're more than friends because we're not united by a we're united by Christ, something spiritual. So we should be devoted to that. Devoted. Now, just so you know, um, you know, I encourage purely dating because where else did you find somebody you know we had those 60 girls come here last year from uh that christian university soccer players i told larry and lucas 
So guys, you ain't ever going to find a chance like this again for the rest of your life. <laughs> I didn't tell you I was going to say that. Sorry. I told Lucas I was going to make a joke. Okay. But it's pure. You know, devoted to one, no, devoted to one another in brotherly love. All right, the next one. Give praise to one another in honor. So love is genuine. It is balanced. It is devoted. Love is respectful. Okay. Give preference to one another in honor. How many of us have a prized possession in our house? You know, um, maybe a painting we love. Maybe a favorite picture. Maybe a family heirloom. Maybe your prized possession is your car. You know, no food in the car. No one can touch your car. There's like a force field around it. Right? Maybe you have a, you know, china set, something sentimental. All right, so we treat that object with respect. We handle it with care. We don't let it get scratched. We don't let it get dropped. We don't let it get lost. We don't let other people hurt it. We honor it. Now imagine you lend that thing to someone else. And they treat it disrespectfully. They say, this whole thing, who cares about that? You know? And then they drop it. Or they smash it. They say, oh, well, I'll just buy you a new one. You know, how does that make you feel? Can you imagine that? Has that happened to you? You still friends with that person, you know? You know, my dad once lent me a pair of Oakleys he had for 15 years. 15 years. School ones with no rim on the bottom, baseball players would wear. And uh, I went and cut the grass with it. And within 10 minutes, that screw fell out. And it went this, and I was, I was weed eating, and it just, they got destroyed. 10 minutes. My dad looked at me. What kind of man am I raising here? You know, no respect for my things. That's what he used to say. You have no respect for what is mine. Fifteen years I had those Oakleys. Now listen, when I want you to look around, people in this room, you know what they are to God? Psalm 17, 8, Psalmist says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. You know, in Hebrew, the apple of the eye literally means the little man in the eye. So when you stare at someone, you know what you're staring at? You see that little person in your eye, that reflection? That's what it's saying they are to God. The apple of his eye, the little man in his eye, he's staring. When it says shadow of your wings, it's referring to like an eagle hovering over her little chicks, you know, hovering over the eggs. It refers to Deuteronomy, chapter 32, speaking about Israel. It says, he found him in a desert land, in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. So God cared about the psalmist. He cared about Israel. But Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.9 that we, the church now, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So we are God's own possession now. The apple of His eye. The one He stares at intimately and fondly and wants to protect, like an eagle protecting her young. So, we always say, that's us. That's me. But it's the person next to you too. So when God sends someone to this church, they are his prized possessions. So we must honor each other. Wait. You know, when God sends someone here, I don't care what their salary is. I don't care how good looking or not they are. I don't care what their personality is like. Their value is not determined by us. It's determined by God. They're his possession. So let's honor his prized possessions and be gentle with them. Not ding them up or scratch them up or forget about them or lose them or ignore them or disrespect them. Let's honor them. <laughs> Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also on the interests of others. This is biblical love. You know, looking at another person being like, God sees something in them and I'm going to love them. I'm going to treat them like God wants them to be treated, not like I think they deserve to be treated. Now, you know, that sounds good, because you probably heard a lot of sermons about that, but aren't there people in church that we find it very easy to ignore? Find it very easy to just pretend like they're not there on Sunday? When their prayer requests come through, we just delete and move on? We should honor each other by praying for each other, by making everyone feel welcome here, by, you know, encouraging everyone when we know they have these needs or these requests. Let them know, hey, I'm praying for you. I love you. And when they need help, we answer the call. So love is genuine. It's balanced. It's devoted. It's respectful. Number five, love is helpful. 
Love is helpful. It says here, skipping down to verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints. I'm going to brag about you guys a little bit. We took a love offering two weeks ago, three weeks ago for the Wero family, and you guys gave a whole lot for that love offering. We took another love offering like two weeks before that for a gentleman that needed some help, and you guys gave a whole lot for that. You know, you've thrown a baby shower for Katie in the fall, one for Rebecca this month, and one for Emily next week. You know, some of you guys brought meals today for Paul and Diane after the surgery. You know, hope they're good. Um, you know, you guys give. Some of you have come to me anonymously, given me gift cards to give out to people who have needs. People have given checks to help with medical bills, school bills, car payments, new clothes, new tires, new batteries, Christmas gifts, and groceries. And many of you guys don't see all this going on, but I get to, because I'm like the middleman. And I'm proud of you guys when you do that. You know, Titus 3.14, Paul writes to Titus and says, Our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. That's love in action. You know, in the early church, that's what they were doing in Acts chapter 6. It said people were sharing so that nobody had these big needs. You know, 1 John 3, 16 and 17. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We ought also to lay our lives down for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? So Paul, John says, we should be willing to die for each other. At the very least, if we're Christians, let's not close our heart off and not help each other out when there's a need. So love helps. Now I know some of you guys don't have the extra cash to give. That's fine. But you know, when Jesus was sitting at the treasury one day, he saw a rich man come through and dump a whole bunch of money in that chest. And then he saw this poor widow come in and drop a penny in. And he says, you know who goes home more righteous? The widow with the penny. Because she gave out of her need, and that guy gave out of his abundance. So when God sees us help each other, he's not caring so much about the dollar amount. Some of us can't give of money and it not cost us a thing. Some people can give just a little bit and it costs them a whole lot. And God knows that. It's about love. Not how many dollars. And some of you, you know, you don't even have a penny to give. But there's a whole lot of ways we can meet needs in each other's lives. And we should be looking to do that. Diligent to meet pressing needs. Love helps. You know, that's love in action. And number six, the last one. Love is hospitable. He says this, two words, practicing hospitality. You know, in the first century, they did not have a lot of hotels. So when a Christian came to a new town, the first thing they did was find out where the church was. And when they came to church, it was expected that the church, somebody would say, you can stay with me tonight. And somebody would say, we're going to give you dinner. And then he'd continue on his way. They were expected to do that. It was so prevalent. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, he says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this same... For by this, some have entertained angels without knowing it. He said, like, hey, some of you guys, when you had that person over for dinner, you didn't know who he was, but he claimed to know Jesus. It's like, hey, he was an angel. That's kind of cool. But what does that look like today? Well, it starts making every person who comes through those doors feel welcomed and loved. I remember when we first started our hospitality team, it was made up of one person, Nancy Kraft, who's sick this morning. One person. And I said, Nancy, here's your job. If someone comes through, you smile at them and you give them a cookie. That's it. She's like, she's like, I can do that. First day on the job, Flavia shows up, this woman who, who's moved now. And uh, Nancy's like, here's your cookie. You want to come out to lunch with me today? She's like, sure. So after church, they go outside, they go to lunch, they come back, and Flavia's car wouldn't start. So she's like, well, let's go get a car battery. Nancy bought her a car battery and then left. So what do you think Flavia walked away knowing? She was loved. I looked at Nancy. I said, it was just, just, you only had to give a cookie. That's it. But that's really cool that you did all of that. You know, I remember uh, this guy named Michael showed up visiting. And uh, it was right before our church became a Petri dish in COVID. So, you know, I think they're, they're a little afraid. But I remember after the church, I wanted to meet this guy, this new guy. He was here alone. And I was like, where did he go? I can't find him. And then it's like, oh, Roberto and Nadia took him out to lunch. So, hey, that's biblical hospitality. You know, we should look to practice that. And not just with visitors, but with each other. You know, sharing a meal with somebody. Um, it's a little intimate. You know, you got to drop your defenses a little bit. If you have them in your home, that can be a little scary. Um, it's just you and them across the dinner table. But that's hospitality. And that's where you really make relationships. The early church, they broke bread and they ate their meals together from house to house. They were all having each other over. You know, this is an act of love. You know, some people in this church, they may have never been invited over somebody's house. 
They may have been invited out to lunch. I know some of you are like, well, what am I going to do? I can't take them to Outback. Wendy's. I had this friend in college. He was a missionary kid from Germany, grew up in Europe, and he was the most hospitable person. Now, he didn't have two dimes to run to get, you know, he didn't have any money. He was broke. But he loved finding ways to be hospitable. And I remember he just got paid. He had like 20 bucks on him. That was the most. I mean, you know, it was like those days when you can't fill up your gas tank without checking your bank account. You want to see how much you have just to be safe. That was our college life. You know, it's like I got $8.99. Okay, I can get like two gallons. Um, I remember we had this guy come in to preach that weekend. He was a big name preacher from some massive church. And, you know, the, the pastor after church is probably going to take this guy to like Ruth Chris Steakhouse and it's all on the church credit card. You know, a big guy. And I remember my friend walked up to him after the service and says, hey, can I take you to Captain D's? <laughs> so he asked him. And if you don't know what Captain D's, it's like Long John Silver's up there in Jacksonville. He's like, can I take you there? And I thought, this guy is nuts. How can you invite a, invite a man like that to a place like that, you know? But this guy, all he wanted to do was show hospitality. So take someone out to lunch. That's love in action. Invite them over. Find a way to make them feel like you think they're valuable. That's biblical hospitality. You can take them to Wendy's and just say, hey, pastor said let's go to Wendy's. Go to Wendy's. That's great. Um... So look around. These are six things. Maybe this week you got six days till next Sunday, right? Monday through Saturday. You can think of one day and say, hey, how can I practice that at my church? Am I practicing that at my church? And if we are not, well, then are we showing love? I know we all think we're loving, but, is, but we have biblical love, what it looks like right here. Are we doing those things? You know, look around. Who have you never eaten a meal with in this room? I challenge you to maybe invite them out to eat. If someone popped in your head right there, someone may have put that thought there. You know, have them over, take them to Wendy's, whatever. Look around. Do you know about a need in this room? If it's in your means to meet that need, I challenge you to meet it. If there's someone whom you've treated in a way that did not honor them, maybe you need to make it right. Maybe you need to start looking at them in a new light. You know, is there someone whom you've forgotten and overlooked? Maybe you need to start acting a little more like their big brother or big sister. Is there someone in this room that you only ever see the bad in? Maybe you need to start clinging to some of the good. Is there someone in this room where you felt in your heart that you needed to say something for a long time? And you've been overlooking it because you're their friend? Maybe you need to speak up and say something. You know, is there someone here whom you always put the mask on for? Maybe we should start being a little more real. That's what love looks like. It acts. It does something. You know, you want to know why we know the Father loves us? Because He demonstrated His love to us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We know the Father loves us. Acted. And Jesus says, men will know that you are mine if you go out and love. So people will never know Jesus loves them unless we act. Unless we act. And people need to know Jesus loves them. They need to know that there is a place in this terrible world where they can come and experience the love of Jesus. And it starts with you. And it starts with me. And it starts right here, in this room, with us choosing to love in action. Let's pray. Father, we love you because you first loved us. And you sent your Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. How amazing is that, Father? How amazing you are that you would love us like that. Lord, help us to be conduits of your love in this world, to be lights in a dark place, to be salt, Father, to just shine for you. Help us to love each other. Give us the to love each other. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.